Okay, I just want to invite everybody before we start to think for a minute about the food that you ate at your last meal. Now, I'm guessing that everyone here is well fed and you probably are thinking about some wonderful, healthy, nutritious, satisfying food. I work in a field called DNA nanotechnology. I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. But for now, I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question, can nanotechnology help us feed the world? What do I mean by that? Do, I mean, can nanotechnology help more people have access to the kind of stable, nutritious, healthy food supply that we have access to? So there are six billion of us on the planet right now, and it's estimated that about one billion of us, unfortunately, are undernourished. In the not so distant, distant future, around 2050, there'll be more like 9 billion of us. And if we want to keep up with the global food demand, we're going to have to increase our crop outputs by about 70%. That is going to be a challenge, especially in the face of climate change, in the face of diminishing resources, and if we want to do this in an environmentally sustainable way. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to meet this challenge? But we need to do it. We need to find innovative ways to do this. Why? Because we need food. What do we need food for? We need food because food gives us energy and it gives us the nutrients and the building blocks that we need in order for our cells, our proteins, our tissues to function. But if we're getting this from our food, where's the food getting the nutrients? Well, for many of those nutrients, like nitrogen, the food is getting the nutrients from the ground. So in the cycle of nutrients, we have the ground giving nutrients to the crop, we harvest the crop, eat it, and we gain some nutrients, and we're using those nutrients to survive and to thrive. But we're leaving a deficit behind. We're leaving a nutrient deficit behind. We need to replenish those nutrients. How can we do that? Well, that's where we need things called fertilizers, right? Fertilizers are crop nutrients. And it turns out that about half of the food supply that we have can be directly linked to using fertilizers. So we need to replenish those nutrients in the ground in order for the next set of crops to be viable and healthy. And if we decided today to stop using fertilizers, we'd have to double our farmland. We have to use 50% more farmland. And we know that's not possible. We know it's important to have a diverse planet. We know the problems of deforestation. So we have to use fertilizers in some way. That's what this is trying to tell us. Actually, recently, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN said just that. They said, if we want to feed all of the people that are here today and all the people that are to come, we're going to have to use fertilizers in some way. But notice they do use the word judicious use of fertilizers. So even though we know these fertilizers are important, these nutrients are necessary, we need to be replenishing the ground. Even in this statement, we notice that there's something that's warning us about these fertilizers. There's something that we have to reconcile with, right? We know that chemical fertilizers have a lot of benefits, but they come at a cost, an, an economic cost, and they come at an environmental cost as well. So what can we do? How can we balance this? What can we get the most out of these fertilizers and minimize the, the, the costs? Well, it turns out that it's not the nutrients themselves that are in the fertilizers that are a problem when the nutrients end up where they belong, which is inside the crop. The problem is that a lot of our fertilizer doesn't end up in the crop. It actually ends up elsewhere. So about half of the fertilizer, for example, when it's nitrogen fertilizer, that farmers are putting on their crops, half of it is ending up somewhere else. It's not ending up in your food. It's ending up in the air or in the water. And that costs money. All that wasted fertilizer costs about a billion dollars a year for the Canadian farmers. But maybe even worse than this economic cost is the environmental cost, right? All that, all those nutrients, if they go, if they're not in the ground, you can't really see this too well, but if you're not in the ground, they're somewhere else, they don't belong. So if they're in the water, it could be leading to dead zones. You may have heard of these things where 
the nutrients that were on the crops were washed into waterways and those fed algal blooms, so algae, and eventually these algae get so out of control that they choke all the oxygen out of that waterway so nothing can survive in it. That's obviously a problem. If the fertilizer ends up in the air, then that's going to lead to greenhouse gas emissions and we know the, the problems, economic and environmental, that are going to come from that. So clearly the key is we need fertilizers, we need fertilizers in, t in order to feed all these people, but we have to do it in a way that's more efficient. The fertilizer has to end up where it belongs. So we need to use less and get more. So can nanotechnology help us do that? That's my question. Because nanotechnology is actually the epitome of using less and getting more. I'm going to stop for a minute now and talk about what nanotechnology is in case you are not familiar with the term. So when I say nano, that term nano, it comes from Greek dwarf, and it's a prefix. It's 10 to the minus 9 or a billionth. So when I say something is a nanometer, it's a billionth of a meter long, say. So that's a really, really small measurement. This little guy here is something called Buckminster Fullerene, and it's a nanoparticle. But nanoparticles can come in all sorts of shapes. They can be spheres, they can be tubes. But something that's important to note about these things is that it's more than just that they're small. They're also special. There's something special about them. They have greater surface area. There's something interesting about their electronics. They glow. There's always something different about a nanomaterial that makes it separate from just a small amount of the bulk. So nanoscience and nanotechnology is looking at ways to apply nanotechnology to important problems. Here's an important problem. We need to be able to produce more food. So can nanotechnology help? So you're going to see this little diagram on and off during the talk, and it's a cartoon of a root. So if we're trying to find ways to deliver fertilizers more efficiently to where they belong, which is inside the plant, we have to be thinking about this guy over here. We have to be thinking about the root, because the root is the gateway to the plant. It turns out that the root is covered with nano-sized pores. So if I just think about it in terms of a size match, maybe that's a great way for me to get fertilizers into the plant. If the pores on the plant and the size of the fertilizer match up, then maybe that's going to lead to more efficient delivery. So myself and my wonderful students, we went out and looked into the literature of the science of, of nanotechnology to see if this sort of a, of a idea, this sort of, a, of an approach would be feasible. And it turns out, even though nanotechnology is this burgeoning field, there's very little nanotechnology that's going into this fertilizer type research. But I'm going to show you two examples in a moment. On the left-hand side, these are tomato plants grown hydroponically. And you can see on one side it says control, and that has a nutrient solution that's feeding those tomato plants. And on the right-hand side it says carbon nanotubes. That nutrient solution has been spiked with a small amount of carbon nanotubes. Well, enough that you can see that it's a dark. And even by eye, you can tell that the yield on the carbon nanotube side is much greater. It's not 100% understood why that is, but they think that there's better uptake of water and potentially nutrients when you have the nanoparticles available to help with the delivery. On the right-hand side is a really powerful microscope image. It's called a transmission electron microscope. And what we're looking at is inside some cells from a root tissue that has been exposed to nanoparticles. And you can see there's these little dots all over that image. Those little dots are actual nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles have been taken up into the root and they found their way into the cells of this plant. So these two things sort of suggest that maybe this is feasible. Maybe we can use nanotechnology to help us make fertilizer delivery more efficient. Kind of thinking about more of it in the terms of drug delivery, rather than just spreading the fertilizer everywhere, using a targeted approach. But that's just looking at things that are small. That's useful. Making nanotechnology, making fertilizer small might improve delivery. But what about making fertilizer smart? And what do I mean by that? What if I make fertilizers that can actually understand when the plant needs nutrients in the first place? It turns out that there are wonderful researchers at Agriculture Canada. Carlos Monreal is in the audience. You can talk to him during the reception. He's working on understanding signals that are coming, chemical signals that are coming out of the roots of many different crops. Maybe one of these signals is a signal that says, I need nutrients. If we can understand, decode these signals, then maybe we can develop fertilizers that are able to communicate with the plant, or at least understand the needs of the plant. 
But now how can we make that leap? How can we take the fertilizer and just from being small and turn it into something that is smart? Well, this is where our research comes in. We work with a type of nanotechnology based on DNA, and this type of nanotechnology is called an aptamer. So an aptamer is just a short piece of DNA. It's a nano-sized shape of DNA, and it's synthetic. We make it in the lab. We don't extract it from a living thing from any cells. We can make it. We have a machine, actually, that makes DNA in our lab. So this piece of DNA, what it does is it can fold up into a specific shape, and that shape will have a fit that allows it to stick to, to recognize another molecule. In this picture, this piece of DNA has folded up into a twisty kind of hairpin, and up in the top, you can see that it has a little pocket where an amino acid is binding to it. So we can make aptamers that are able to fold into shapes that can recognize things like drugs, toxins, viruses, bacteria, pretty much any type of molecular target. And what's interesting about these aptamers is that they not only bind really tightly, they don't recognize and just grab onto something really tightly, they also are very specific. So you can have two molecules that are very similar, and if you do your aptamer design properly or discovery properly, you can find an aptamer that will bind to one and not the other. So this could be something really useful for our smart fertilizers. What we've done next is taken these aptamers and made nanoscale coatings of them. So essentially, this coating can one day be something that would coat a fertilizer or maybe a drug. And Inside these, these coatings, the aptamer is able to do its job, which is recognize something. That circle in the top is just showing you what the composition of these coatings are. Those ribbons are polymer, and embedded in the polymer are those little squiggles. Those are the aptamer. In this model system, the aptamer is binding to a dye. And what you're seeing on, the, on the, that square, that's a microscope image, a fluorescence microscope image. And those little bright spots are the aptamer grabbing on, recognizing, and grabbing onto the dye and holding on. If we take this coating and expose it to a different dye that it's not meant to bind to, the aptamer won't bind to it and the coating won't recognize it. So basically, what this was showing us is that we can develop coatings, films, that are going to do that first step of the process. They're going to do the recognition part. So if we want our fertilizer to recognize a chemical signal, then this is the first step. But now, the next thing that we wanted to do was make them into capsules. So they're shown here as a cartoon as these little green circles. You'll see a microscope image in a minute of what they actually look like. So these capsules now could be filled with fertilizer. In our model experiments, they're filled with dye. But this is going to allow us to measure how things are moving in and out of the capsule. It's green because the aptamer is tagged with the green dye in this case. So what I'm going to show you now is an animation, which is sort of how we envision these smart fertilizers might work one day. It's going to loop a few times so you'll have a chance to take a look at it. But basically, you can see that green capsule there. That's our aptamer capsule. In that film, there are those yellow loops. Those yellow loops are representing the aptamer. Those capsules are covering up some orange balls, which are supposed to represent fertilizer. And they're pretty good at it. Some fertilizer might leak out on its own, but it's pretty good at containing the fertilizer, not allowing it to be released. But when those blue signals come out of the root and come into contact with those aptamers that are in the capsule, the job of the aptamer is to notice those signals and to grab them. And when it does that, it does it in a certain way. Remember I was telling you these aptamers can fold around their targets. So you see those loops turned around and they grabbed onto the target and they led to a change in the properties of that capsule. Turns out that that capsule, if things were working properly, would become more porous and more fertilizer would be released when the signal was recognized. So we've been doing proof of concept experiments here, and one of my students, Yasser Sultan, is in the audience, and he's been involved with this from the beginning. What we've been doing is loading these capsules up with dye, and we've had the aptamers that are in the coating of the capsule specific just for a model compound. What it turns out to happen is that when that aptamer detects, recognizes that model compound, it turns out that those capsules themselves do become more porous, and we do see an increase in, in the movement of the dye in and out of the capsule. So those are our proof of concept experiments. That is you know, the, the indication to us that maybe one day we will be able to use these things in fertilizers. So now we're moving away from our model experiments. We're trying to develop aptamers that actually do recognize these chemical signals and incorporating them into these films so that we will be able to make these smart fertilizers. 
I want to sort of just end off thinking about what this might look like in the future. What I sort of imagine is that the farmers will be sprinkling these fertilizers onto their fields, right? Using less and getting more. That's the ideal. I want to end with us going back to our thought. We were thinking about food earlier. We're thinking about all the food that we've been eating, say, today. And what I'm hoping is that this technology and also the work of others in the field is going to lead to a day when almost everybody around the world is going to be able to imagine that as their last meal, an abundant, healthy food supply. Thank you.